Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Hi, and welcome to our first webinar together. My name is Christina Crowley Arkley, proud dairy farmer's daughter, coming to you today from Guelph, Ontario. I'm pleased to be here moderating today's webinar with you and taking you through today's agenda with our expert speakers we're going to be listening to. We appreciate you taking the time out of your farming schedule today to join us on a very important topic, of course, to you as a dairy farmer and to our Canadian consumers, the topic of sustainability. In terms of housekeeping instructions for today's webinar, we please ask that you keep off all of your cameras and that you also mute your microphones. But throughout, as you're thinking of questions, please do write them down or feel free to put them in the chat function and we will be taking questions throughout if time is allowing us. Today's webinar is also going to be re uh, recorded, so there will be a replay available uh, at the end and it will be sent throughout to everyone. We'd like to thank Dairy Farmers of Canada, who of course have funded our webinar series. This webinar series has been funded by Dairy Farmers of Canada and is organized by Lactinet as part of the DFC National Traceability Knowledge uh, Transfer Project. So thank you so much, Dairy Farmers of Canada, for helping to put this on for our dairy farming community today. Today's webinar is the first webinar of three webinars coming to you throughout the month of March. So today's topic in relation to sustainability is around herd management and feeding. So from our experts today, we're going to be learning about the introduction to sustainability. Of course, listening to uh, our Dr. Um, ben Shar, who's going to be speaking to us about enteric methane and feed and longevity heifer breeding and herd health. And then, of course, throughout the rest of March, we'll be working together on our two other webinar topics. Today we're going to be joined by a number of experts and fellow producers who are going to bring us our topic. So we're going to be listening first to the introduction of sustainability from Hannah Sweet, who is a knowledge transfer specialist of genetics from Lactinet. We have, of course, Dr. Shuki Benshar, who's a researcher at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Sherbrooke Research and Development Centre. And he, as I mentioned, is going to be speaking to us today about enteric methane and animal diets. At that point, if we do have time, we will take questions, but as I mentioned, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We will then learn about the Sustainability Index from Hannah Sweet again, and we will end our webinar today listening to uh, a guest producer, Vivian Mathieu from Firm Caribou from Quebec. Uh, we are going to be listening to her uh, practices on the farm relating to herd management and feeding, and then we will take questions if time allots at the end as well. We're going to now begin our webinar with Hannah from well, Lactinet, who's going to welcome us to products. Introduction to Sustainability. When we are interested in the environment in agriculture production, we are led to evaluate the impact of activities, or conversely, how better practices will reduce these impacts. And it is the same when we are interested in issues or contributions of an economic or even social context. The purpose of these webinars is not to cover all of these issues, even if they concern or involve dairy producers themselves, individually or collectively, or their stakeholders, such as employees, their suppliers and customers, or even the society that's nourished by food products. Firstly, because we wouldn't have the time, but also because these days it's still impossible to put all of that into an equation to find the desired balance or the miracle recipe. Sustainability is therefore a concept that encompasses different things depending on the perspective that we consider and also depending on who talks about it and to who we talk about it with. Being sustainable therefore means finding the balance or making the best compromise between aspects that affect the environment, the economy and society as a whole. So our goal is to take a perspective that is in tune with the key issues of sustainability and in particular the commitments that have been made by the dairy sector that will lead to medium to long term results. For example, the net zero target by 2050 for the Canadian government as well as the dairy sector with an intermediate target for low carbon milk by 2050 as well as the national commitment to reduce methane emissions by 2030 and the development of national and provincial initiatives such as sustainability strategies and roadmaps. Lastly, this also includes commitments from all players in the dairy processing industry with targets for reducing the carbon footprint of processed dairy products to which on-farm greenhouse gas emissions contribute the most. 
These include science-based targets that will meet commitments to limit the global temperature rise by 1.5 degrees by 2100. And so this is why we have chosen to structure the three webinars by selecting themes that are key to the carbon neutrality strategy. We will refer regularly to the best managed practice guide recently published by Dairy Farmers of Canada as shown here. The goal of carbon neutrality is to balance by 2050 all greenhouse gas emissions associated with dairy production through the adoption of best practices that aim at one, reducing emissions and two, eliminating or removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through the sustainable sequestration of carbon in biomass and soils. We are aware that admissions will never be zero, hence the importance of best managed practices and incre increasing sequestration. The figure here on the left shows the sources of greenhouse gas emissions associated with dairy production. Greenhouse gases of concern are mainly carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And each of these has a different impact on climate change per unit of mass. So for methane, it's about 30 times more impacting than carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxide is up to 300 times. Estimating the carbon footprint requires assessing the inventory for these three greenhouse gases, tackling a life cycle perspective where the entire value chain is considered, not just what happens on the dairy farm. Greenhouse gas emissions from operations upstream of the farm that indirectly contribute to the dairy farm's ability to operate are also taken into account as well as carbon sequestration in soils and biomass, particularly from grasslands, as well as perennial plants or woody biomass, such as trees and hedges, is an important aspect of achieving carbon neutrality. This carbon dioxide sink adds to the reduction in the overall greenhouse gas inventory. So therefore, with this inventory exercise, we're able to calculate what is called the carbon footprint of milk. So in addition to providing a number, such as how much greenhouse gases are admitted per kilogram of milk, the carbon footprint allows us to identify the farm activities or inputs that generate the highest emissions so that we can prioritize actions to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. So by taking a look at this pie chart, we can see by decreasing importance that enteric methane feed production and manure management are the three largest contributors to the carbon footprint of milk here in Canada, according to the latest study conducted by the Dairy Farmers of Canada. It is important to note, however, that this assessment for 2016 does not include soil carbon sequestration or losses in the inventory. So the goal of this series of three webinars is to essentially highlight ways of reducing the carbon footprint of your dairy operations, where a number of actions and good practices can have an impact. Great, thank you so much, Hannah, for that introduction to sustainability. I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Shuki Benchar, who's gonna be speaking to us about enteric methane and animal diets. Uh, Dr. Benchar is a research scientist uh, with uh, the Sherbrooke Research and Development Centre located in Quebec uh, of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, which he began in April 2000. His research program focuses mainly on three things, quantification and mitigation of enteric methane emissions from dairy cows, two, the impact of dietary enteric methane and strategies on emissions from stored manure, and three, dietary and nutritional approaches to reduce nitrogen excretion from dairy cows. Uh, Dr. Benchar is the co-leader of the Technical Advisory Group on Feed Additives of the Livestock Environmental Assessment and Performance Partnership, known as LEAP, of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, also known as FAO. Thank you so much, Dr. Benchar. I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Christina. So do you see my slides? Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for again for uh, to Lactanet for the invitation and, and directly to the Dairy Farms of Canada for their, this interesting webinar. So I have uh, about 10 to 30, 15 minutes to cover this topic. And you know, it's not uh, easy to cover such big topic in uh, just short time, a short uh, time. So I will try to, to, to give uh, the most important information. So, uh, First, I would like to to explain how methane is produced in the rumen. So, what what uh, 
we sh you should know that the, the feed was ingested by the 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 the, the animal uh, the the cow especially the carbohydrate fraction it enters the rumen and it is fermented by uh, all the kind of microbes diverse microbes that uh, are the rumen and from the fermentation of the carbohydrates we have first the production of volatile fatty acids mainly acetate propionate and butyrate and these fatty acids are source of energy to the, to the uh, remnant uh, almost 70 percent of metabolism energy if provided through vfa uh, there were there are also the production uh, of uh, carbon two gases carbon dioxide and hydrogen and in the, in the room the, the there are uh, spe uh, specialized uh, microbes called the methanogens which actually take the two gases take that has co2 and they are used with hydrogen to produce methane. And in contrast to uh, VFA, to volatile fatty acids, uh, methane, it's a loss of energy to the animal. It's uh, why it's important from a nutrition point of view to mitigate enteric meth methane addition in addition to uh, reduce its emission in the atmosphere because it's potent greenhouse gas. So how methane is released in, uh, in the atmosphere first? Uh, uh, what you should know that most of uh, the, the methane is produced in the rumen, about 90%, and the remaining 10% in the hindgut. So, and uh, contrary to popular beliefs, so, sorry, uh, methane is not released for, uh, through flatulences, but mostly through uh, uh, irritation and uh, uh, by irritation and by respiration through non the nostrils and the mouth. The remaining uh, one to five percent is released through uh, via the rectum. So, as I said uh, earlier, the methane uh, methane is a, a production is loss of pro productive energy, representing two to twelve percent of gross energy intake uh, if, for uh, ruminants in general, and four to seven percent for dairy cows fed forest based diet and three to four percent to uh, feedlot cat cattle which uh, are fed high, high grain diets so the approach to reduce the carbon footprint and what i mean by the carbon footprint footprint is the amount of greenhouse gas uh, emissions per kilogram of milk uh, i mean kilogram of co2 equivalent per kilogram of milk and we have two different approaches the first one is through the reduction of enteric methane we reduce directly the uh, the process itself it means uh, less methane per unit of milk and the second approach is, of course, by enhancing animal productivity, which means more milk per unit of uh, uh, methane emitted. And this is what, what the dairy farms across Canada have been doing uh, for years uh, through enhancing animal productivity and, of course, uh, feed efficiency. So uh, I'm going uh, now to talk about the forages and how they can help to mitigate enteric methane emission uh, uh, this topic is also uh, very large all what you should know that uh, all uh, type of forest strategy that can increase dry matter intake it, of course it will increase uh, milk production uh, because we provide more nutrient to the animal and it will reduce methane emissions especially methane yield which is gram of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake or as a percentage of uh, gross energy the first thing we tested in sherbrooke is to replace uh, uh, legume or grass silages uh, with the uh, cereal forages like corn silage and the difference between the two is the corn silage uh, has higher starch content, content which decreases methane, especially when expre expressed as a, a, a as percentage of gross energy intake. We know that uh, uh, diets based on corn silage improve animal productivity, which means uh, less methane per kilogram of milk. We know also that uh, legumes uh, are, are, are more efficient than grass to reduce uh, methane because they contain low, uh, lower fiber uh, in, in the forage. And with lower fiber, uh, this low uh, content fiber, uh, it means that the, the, the passage uh, uh, of the feeds from the mineral is faster, which means uh, less methane per, per kilogram dry matter intake. And of course, uh, feeding legumes is, is known to uh, increase animal productivity because uh, of the higher uh, or the greater dry matter intake. However, here uh, caution must, may be taken because sometimes the plant maturity at harvest can be confounding factor. Enhancing forage quality is another strategy, although it's not easy to achieve, especially with all the 
the change in the climate that we, we are facing the, over the last year. For example, uh, uh, there is a, we, we can harvest at optimal stage or early maturity to improve uh, forest quality, which means uh, uh, greater dry matter intake and improved dry matter in, uh, digestibility. And in the end, less methane produced per kilogram of milk or per, or, uh, uh, per kilogram of dry matter intake. Another option to reduce enteric methane is by adding unsaturated fats, especially vegetable fats, to the diet. The advantage of this strategy is there are uh, several sources of fat uh, available, but the effect, the mitigation effect, is uh, va may vary the, according to different factors, including the level of supplementation. In our case, we recommend less than four percent of added fat, and this may vary according to the diet, and especially the forage uh, composing uh, uh, the diet. Uh, also, the efficacy of uh, fat to reduce methane depends on the form of the oil and the form of the fat supplements. O oils are uh, more effective than seeds. And of course, it can also differ, uh, de depends on the type of diet. High grain diets are more responsive than high forage diet. The only limitation with adding unsaturated fats is the high cost. We can therefore use other alternative sources, like we use in distilled grain uh, with uh, solubles, and we're able to reduce methane by 10%. Uh, the, 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 is it, it is necessary to offset the high cost by improved productivity, or, or otherwise it will not adapt by the dairy farms, farms because it will not benefit from an economical point of view. And depending on the amount of the, the form added, it can have an adverse effect on milk fat synthesis and fiber digestion, and this is something that we don't like to occur, especially for milk fat. For a feed additive, there is different uh, type of feed additive. There is one is uh, who is attra attracting uh, more attention. It's the 3-NOP, uh, which uh, is uh, the 3 uh, nitro oxypropanol, uh, and this feed additive that is uh, that has been approved in Canada recently. Uh, the commercial name is Bovair. It is a market uh, is it is it pro uh, manufactured by uh, DSM uh, Nutrition. And in this slide, I sh uh, here we sh I show an experiment conducted in Penn State, 12 week experiment, and we uh, they added. Uh, uh, the three NOP or Bovair at different doses, 40, 60, and 80 milligram per kilogram dry matter intake. And yet, as you can see here, here's the control. And as you can see, all the doses result in the decrease uh, in um, emission expressed a gram per day. On average, there is a 30% reduction reduction in emissions when we use uh, the three NOP. The three NOP uh, is therefore effective in reducing methane. The only question right now is the high cost. Uh, according to my knowledge, it costs uh, 50 cents a dose, which is uh, relatively expensive. Uh, the through uh, the three NOP uh, has been shown to have low risk for human health. Uh, as I said, it was approved in Canada recently, so it, it is now approved uh, for use in dairy cow uh, rations. The adoption barriers for its uh, its uh, its uh, its acceptance or uh, uh, by the dairy farms, it's right now is as I, I mentioned, is that really it in, it can increase the feeding cost uh, if there is it's not the its use is not associated with an, an improved in uh, animal productivity. So if we'd like to dairy farms to adopt the three NOP, uh, I think the, the it should uh, we, we should, uh, it should have uh, uh, some incentives. So uh, maybe we can hire uh, have higher prices for milk products with low carbon footprint. So uh, as conclusion, uh, there are several dietary strategies. I gave you some example with foragers and fed additions. We have feed additives, especially for example, three NOP that other supplements like seaweed, I don't have, don't have the time to, to talk about this. Uh, also, we can combine different strategies to achieve larger reductions uh, in, in methane, uh, like for example, uh, uh, combining three NOP and lipids. Uh, mitigating enteric methane is, of course, uh, necessary. It helps, but it's not enough to decrease the carbon footprint because as it was mentioned earlier by, uh, by Hannah, uh, the 50% the, uh, of the carbon footprint is from enteric methane uh, and the, the, the 50, remaining 50% is from other sources. 
This is something that you would like to emphasize that we need to conduct life cycle assessment for any strategies, the dietary strategies that aims to reduce a methane, uh, enteric methane production. This is to ensure that the reduction methane do not lead to increase of other greenhouse gases uh, emission in the entire farm system. Again, for any type of uh, uh, or any kind of dietary strategies, uh, a dietary strategy is not adaptive if, if it's not associated with increased productivity. Uh, again, there will be some. Uh, we need to have financial incentives to the dairy farmers. Need to encourage. Uh, this is needed to encourage adoption by the farmers. And also, this is something that we should not neglect and take into account is the social act acceptance. Like for example, especially when we use feed additives, it can be antibiotics or chemical additives. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope that uh, I respect uh, the 10 or the 15 mi minutes allowed to me. Thank you very much, and I will take any question that you might have. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Benshar. I feel like I got an incredible lesson that I clearly needed to have on this topic a bit how to understand our cows and how they operate in this whole conversation around environment and sustainability and climate change. Uh, of course, I also have to acknowledge what a great photo that was of the dairy cow. I was very happy to see she had her traceability ear tag as a former Holstein Cannon employee. So thank you for that. Uh, as we did mention, we are taking um, questions. If anyone has any, there is a Q&A function that you can provide. Um, and if any of the questions we don't get to today, we are going to be uh, recording them and making sure that we can follow up in any way when we send out the webinar uh, recording with the replay, that we can answer any questions there. While farmers are maybe thinking about something, while they're stewing on a lot of information there, Dr. Benchar, I do want to ask one question. Um, in regards to feed additives, do you know if there have been trials and any proof of their efficiency in the long run, year over year or even longer? Or is there still research that's needed in that area? around feed additives. I think that there is some indication there is only a few papers that on long term uh, it seems that it's uh, it's uh, the effect is, is sustained over over time but uh, it me it me it seems that the effect may vary according to the, the, the basal diet fed to dairy cows. In Canada, I, uh, much of, of the work was done on beef cattle especially at the, the leather breed research center and of course they showed efficiency. In dairy, uh, unfortunately not in Canada, but uh, with the, the support of Dairy Farms of Canada, as a part of the cluster, uh, scientific cluster, we'll be conducting trial on three NOP, and of course the data will be available as a, a part of the technology transfer to the dairy farms. Uh, and so, you know, that's such a great follow up because we did have a question in the Q&A function uh, from Lindsay Beaver's great question. Uh, if you don't mind answering this one, Dr. Benshar, uh, how can we get ahead of the potentially negative social narrative surrounding 3-NOP as a feed additive that reduces CH4 emissions? Will it be positioned as an additive supplement? And I, I do want to, I'm not going to even attempt to try the full name for 3NOP because I understand it was a mouthful when you talked about it in your presentation. If you can just remind everyone what 3NOP stood for. 3NOP is 3 nitro oxypropanol. So this is the, the active ingredient that is, uh, it's really, it's it, it's effect that it targets directly the methanogens, the, the microbes uh, that uh, uh, synthesize methane. So it, it directly inhibits methane uh, production in the rumen. Uh, how we can go ahead of potentially negative social narratives around the ethanopy? This is a very important question because the consumers in general, they are very, very, uh, let's say, very sensitive to when we talk about using feed additive, even in a human diet or human feed, for example. What we should know is that uh, for in Canada, we have uh, the CFI, which is Canadian uh, Feed Inspection Agency, uh, and the process of, uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, approval is very, very strict. So we do not approved just based on the claim that you reduce methane, but the, the, the industry, in this case, especially the company, has provided evidence that there is no, uh, no, no uh, I mean, it's safe for the consumers, it's safe for the animal. And this is, of course, it, it's, it's a question of uh, make the consumer aware and it's a part of our uh, our our uh, duty as researcher and also like uh, uh, like planet dairy farms of canada to really uh, secure the consumer that it can be 
uh, fed uh, to dairy to, to, to dairy cows without any any problems. And uh, I think we have enough competence in Canada when it's uh, it comes to approve uh, feed additives. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Benchar. Great question, because that is absolutely going to be if it's a, if it's already been approved in Canada, as it's recently been approved, um, I'm sure it will be something that our farmers will be thinking about. Um, so appreciate uh, the, the answers to the questions and, of course, for coming today and speaking uh, with us. Uh, I'm now going to pass it over back over to uh, Hannah of Lactinet, who uh, is going to speak to us about the Sustainability Index. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you, Christina. Let's take a few minutes to introduce you to the Lactinet Sustainability Index, as we'll be talking about it in our interview with Vivian, our producer. Here we're talking about herd sustainability and not sustainability in the broader sense of the term that we looked at in the introduction. This index was developed two years ago by Lactinet, and it is a three-level composite index. So there are 10 indicators combined into four different categories that are then farther aggregated into one single indicator. This enables performance to be read and monitored at different levels. It addresses several issues that are identified here. For example, if we look at the feeding and production category, it includes a measure of urea nitrogen content in the milk to see if it's out of normal range. It also looks at the cow management score proxied from the milk actually produced by the cows compared to what their genetics would tell us, hence identifying any management issues. And lastly, the transition index that tells us specifically if the transition strategy in place is efficient or not based on any projected milk deviations from the expected milk production. Here is the Sustainability Index dashboard where indicators, results, and time trends are presented. We will explain the use of this dashboard using a real example during the following interview with Vivian. Great. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that. Uh, we are very excited to have our guest producer with us, who, of course, has taken a time out of her schedule today, just like you, uh, to join us for the webinar. So we're going to be listening to Vivian Matthew of Firm Caribou. She's doing an interview with Josiane Prince, who's a Lactinet advisor. Uh, and we're going to be listening to what Vivian has did on her farm in terms of herd management. Uh, so I'll pass it over to you. Excited for our conversation. Welcome to Caribou Farm. Work located in Terrebonne. My name is Vivian Matrio. I'm proud to be part of the sixth generation of the Matrio family who have been on this land since 1877. We are a dairy farm with 280 kilos of quota. We have on average 160 cows in lactation and a total herd of 320 head. Our herd is made up of 100% purebred Holsteins. They're milked twice a day by a 20 stall carousel system. We farm a thousand acres. We do grass silage, corn silage, grain corn, and soy. With these four crops, we end up with a really good rotation. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I went to ITA St. Hyacinth in food processing. I'll also explain a little later why I chose this program and then came back home to the farm. I think it's important to introduce our team as well. It's thanks to the people we have that we're here today and that we're proud of our farm. So I'm going to start with our three foreign workers from Guatemala. We have Luis Fernando, Luis Annabel, and Carlos. After that, we have my grandparents, who are still very present on the farm. My grandfather, Gilbert, my grandmother, Claudette, there's my mother, Laure, and my dad, who keeps an eye on things both in the barn and in the fields. There's also my sister, Veronique, who's an agrologist, and myself, who handles herd management, administration, and finance. And then there's Marc Antoine, who's been with us for about 10 years now, as well as Nancy. It's because of this great team that we can take our operation farther than before and that we're able to reach our goals. 
En parlant de la durabilité, je pense qu'on... Speaking of sustainability, I think it's a great time to mention why I went into food processing. It's because we're looking to expand into on-farm cheese processing as early as next year. It's a project that's also close to our hearts since it's all about making the most of the milk produced on the farm and to be able to show our customers what agriculture is all about, to have a link between the cheese and the barn all the way to the table. You'll be able to buy aged cheeses in 2025 from Caribou Farm. Sustainability is really important to us. It's really important to us to have a whole farm that can stand the test of time. This is why we've implemented a lot of environmental and sustainable practices. We use chopped pallets as shavings for bedding, and we recycle all the plastic from our bunkers. We're implementing several green fertilizers and cover crops, and we're also participating in a number of other projects, including doing our own emission calculations. We're trying as much as possible to put practices in place for sustainability and the environment in the future. So good morning, I'm Josiane Prince, agronomist, and I've been a dairy production advisor at Lactanet in the Laurentid region and an advisor at Film Caribou for the past two years. So today we're here to talk about sustainability and more specifically your herd management. At the moment, we're in your nursery, and over the last few years, we've made a lot of changes in terms of replacement subjects. Can you tell us a little more about the context that made you want to work on this aspect of your business? It's been a while that we've wanted to reevaluate our rearing costs since they've been rising over the last few years. We also had an overpopulation of calves. We were breeding a lot of heifers compared to cows that maybe weren't necessary for our herd. This gave us a total heifer per cow ratio of 1.1, so we had a lot of replacements. This led to disease problems in the nursery due to stocking density, and they were displaced into other areas. So it was really on those points that we decided we needed to improve our whole replacement program. What's more, we also wanted to increase our third lactation percentage, which was around 39% two years ago. Okay, so why did you think it was important to, uh, to take action on this? Well, because for us, we always wanted to improve ourselves, you know. We wanted not just an efficient herd, but also one that was economically efficient. So we've tried to reevaluate everything that's relevant. So now, We've also evaluated our rations to have a stricter follow-up on the heifer rations, which we didn't have two years ago. It was hay silage back then, which we looked after a little less. We said to ourselves that it's the succession plan for our cows. So if the calves and heifers do well, there's a better chance that they'll be more productive once they become cows, that's for sure. And also in terms of the environment to have fewer heifers. Yes, exactly. And less heifers to have to fill the same quota, the same production. And well, it certainly means less methane in total with fewer heifers to make the same milk. And in your opinion, what are the key points for successfully reducing your breeding rate in your business? So I think initially it takes good operational management overall to avoid any unexpected illness or involuntary loss in your heifers. The heifers you bring into the world, you have to be certain to be able to keep them until the end. You need to work on your involuntary culling before being able to say, okay, we can reduce our replacement rate. That's one of the key points to make sure you nail before doing anything else. Also, it's also important to establish, for example, a weight chart, that weights are taken to make sure that growth is actually happening and that the feed is right for the age and group of animals. And what do you think needs to be done to successfully reduce your breeding rate? I think you have to make sure that all those points are optimized as much as possible. So that's why we, with the heifers, before changing anything, we changed the mattresses and put memory foam mattresses, then recycled tires. It's improved heifer comfort. 
and we also added a lot of ventilation, with fans on each side of the barn, again for summer comfort. So first, to confirm growth, and second, that they're comfortable while growing. Okay. okay, so in practical terms, can you explain a bit more about what you put in place to work on this point on a daily basis? Yes, so things have been working well lately. We had Rodrigo Milano from Lactinet help us start a project on the performance of young stock. So with Rodrigo and his team, including Josie Ann, we started to take the weights of all of our heifers every month. With this, we were able to get data to calculate our rearing costs and to use this data to improve and to find solutions. So it really helped us to calculate this before starting anything. It was fun since we also calculated weights after the modifications we've made to the heifer program. It needs to be said that with Rodrigo's project, we were really well guided and that all the data that was collected over a long time. It took us two years to come up with the data and the results and not all herds can afford to do that sort of thing. It really depends on the management of the herd and the follow-up you're able to do afterwards. And now the project is over, but you continue to take weights regularly on your animals. Yeah, exactly. We're still in the habit of doing that because it's really important data and it gives us a good idea of whether things are going well or whether we have things we need to change. So the calves, we basically weigh them at birth and again at eight days. So when they leave their paired box. Then they're weighed again before weaning and after weaning. We started weaning at 55 days. They're fed completely ad lib from birth until 55 days. After, we have a weaning period of 20 days where we decrease the concentration and they finish weaning with water. During weaning, they also have access to corn silage, a ration and a bit of starter. During weaning, they have access to those add-ons and afterwards, they no longer have starter access. They only have silage. Okay, so let's talk a little more about the transition period. What have you put in place at that level? For the transition period and our calving preparations, we're on an anionic ration and we monitor urinary pH levels quite closely. So with that, we're able to adjust our ration appropriately so we don't have milk fever. They freshen really well. We also have calving pens since the dry cows are housed in free stalls. Once we see one who is ready to calve or her water breaks, we move her to a calving pen with a memory foam mattress. She can calve on her own in her own pen. And regarding the cows, have you made any changes to improve productivity? We actually made a big change to BMR corn silage, which is a highly digestible silage. So it made us a lot more profitable in terms of milk quantity. So we get two or three liters more milk per cow. Despite the 10% lower yields in the field, economically, it offsets pretty well. It's something that has improved things a lot. In terms of food efficiency? Yes, that too. And with the addition of the lactinate team, we're also doing more frequent follow-up on cow rations and everything that encompasses feed efficiency. And in the cow shed for lactating cows, in terms of animal welfare and comfort, what has been implemented? So for us, Welfare has always been a priority. There are things already in place, but we're always improving. The cows are housed on water mattresses with a thin layer of bedding. Not only that, but in summer, we don't have any drop in production thanks to all the ventilation we've added. All the fans we put on the cows in the summer, it does a really good job of things. So with your milk recording data, plus the data from your herd management software, you have a lot of information. Can you tell us a little bit more about the results of all these changes? Yes, 
Yes. So if we go back and compare, say, two years ago, like I said, we were at 1.1 heifers per cow, and now we're at 0 0.63 heifer per cow. So we've really reduced the number of replacement heifers we have. That's had a big impact on the calculations. After that, the percentage of third lactation cows and older, actually by looking at a graph, you can see that year after year, we're increasing our percentage. So this year, we're up to 48% third lactation and older. Before, we were much, much lower. And has this had an impact on your veterinary expenses? Actually, no. That's the thing. We can see that vet costs have stayed the same. Even though we have more old cows, our costs have really remained the same as before. Though it's true that before, the reason we had fewer third calvers and older is that we had so many heifers entering the herd, that it was the third calvers and older that left first. We had a much higher turnaround then than we do now. Now, it's not actually necessary to call the, these third lactations because right now they're still in the barn and they're still profitable versus if we had a high rate of involuntary calling, for example. And in terms of the age at first calving, because by monitoring the weight of heifers, we're able to better adapt our breeding management. So what does it look like now? Well, basically, before we were at two years, one month. Before we made all the changes with Rodrigo's project, and by improving the rations for each group of heifers, we were able to have a higher body weight and then service them a little earlier. So now we're here and have them calving at one year, 10 months. So all this has had a nice economic impact on the company, I suppose. Yes, absolutely. It all plays a big financial role. Everything we've been able to initiate has been beneficial to the farm. So what you've put in place in terms of management seems to be working well, as we can see from your milk management index, which has risen by almost a thousand points in the last two years. So in addition to the genetic improvements that have been made in the herd, we can see the improvement that management also had on your productivity. Can you tell us more about the figures behind this? In terms of herd productivity, what are the differences between 2020 and today? Yes, on the sustainability side, I can maybe mention that since 2020, we produced 44 kilos more with 40 more cows, but with 50 less heifers. So once again, the heifer to cow ratio, as mentioned earlier, plays an important role. We make more milk, but with fewer total head. So it's really something that we can go with. In terms of our management index, Actually, it's a lot of little things that make it possible for us to achieve this level of management. So let's look at Caribou Farm Sustainability Index. We're able to see that they are very well positioned for the overall index on a percentile level. So right now they're in the 90th percentile. If we look at their history, we can see that they've always stayed in the top 10 in the country. So as for the different criteria of the sustainability index, if we start with longevity and third lactation, as well as higher cutting rate, we can see that it's above the national average, but we can also see a good improvement there over the last two years. And the same thing for the herds and voluntary calling. If we look at the herds management index, and just to give you a quick reminder of what exactly the management index is, uh, it's that given that the herd is at 1,655, it means that this allows them to produce 1,655 kilos more than what their genetics should allow them to produce. So we can see that the efforts they've made over the last few years have paid off, uh, especially because we've seen a great improvement since 2020 of almost 1,000 points. The last sub-criterion for feed and production is the transition index. We can see that since 2021, the herd has been in a very good position with a very positive index above 1,000 points. And uh, we know that the transition period is crucial for getting off to a good start in terms of milk production. So we've seen that what 
that what they've put in place seems to be working very well within the herd, and they're giving it their best effort to ensure that the transition period goes smoothly. Finally, the last criterion that would be important to look at would be the age at first calving, since Vivian talked a little bit about the changes that were made regarding this in 2020. Uh, so when they were at an age of first calving of two years and one month. Now they're more around one year and 10 months. So we can see a nice improvement at this level, which is reflected on their sustainability index graph. So earlier you told me about Rodrigo's project. We had calculated the number of heifers to be raised per month. Have these objectives been reached? Where are we now? So Rodrigo had calculated that we needed five heifers a month to support our replacement needs. We found that wasn't a lot because we were around 10 to 12 heifers a month in 2020 and with less kilos of quota too. So 10 to 12 heifers per month was too much. Rodrigo wanted five heifers a month. So we brought that down to six to seven heifers a month. We've had that for the past two years now with the evolution of the farm. We're now aiming for eight or nine heifers a month to have enough replacements to keep up with our increasing production year over year. Yeah, so for company expansion projects. That's it exactly. We want to expand the barn too. What's more, we need heifers to be able to fill more quota. So we've adjusted the situation with our number of heifers while still maintaining a respectable level and not going too high since it isn't really necessary. Okay, so the company's objectives and those of the work team are evolving over time. Can you tell us more about that? I know you've just talked a bit about expanding the company, but what's coming up for you in the next few years? Yes, a project we've been working on for some time would be to make the calving area into a bed pack, which is really one aspect of animal welfare that we can really improve. One will expand the cow barn, we'll be able to add stalls, as well as space for close-up cows and for our dry cows to further maximize calving and consequently calves. But before all that, we have to move to three milkings. We really wanted to get the most out of the barn we have right now. Two milkings is fine, but we'll wait until the barn is full at three milkings before going ahead with any expansion. These are all practices that are fairly recent, so we can't see all the results yet. Sometimes it takes two years before you can see the effect of the actions we've taken, but we're happy to have made the changes. So I think, in conclusion, that you've put a lot of work into your business. So what would you recommend to other companies who might want to make important changes like you've done here on the farm? But I think that initially, it's about knowing where you're going to go and then knowing if you're even capable. If we have all the staff to do it and also the resources to be able to move forward with projects or more sustainable practices or to improve rearing, I also mentioned earlier that the people around you are important, and that's a very, very big point. And uh, basically, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess, because what's applicable here isn't necessarily applicable elsewhere. No, that's for sure, because every operation has points to improve that we don't have, you know, or that other farms have and that we don't in terms of objectives. Because really, every operation has its own challenges and objectives. It's different for everyone. And it also depends on the level of management you're capable of achieving. And of course, when you want to do major projects like this, there's always the monetary side to consider. So how do you go about it? Well, any action has to be calculated beforehand, precisely to know what risks we're willing to take and whether it's a big risk or a small one in financial terms. Then after that, we follow up on the data we've been given, then the calculations. We're able to make more informed decisions as to whether to go for this choice or another, depending on what the calculations have shown. 
like all our actions have been implemented on the farm to improve our replacements. It was calculated, and then we decided to go ahead because we had positive results once the calculations had been made. So to show that it was profitable to move forward. Exactly. So thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Josiane. Well, thank you very much, Vivian and Josiane, for that uh, wonderful conversation about what our dairy farmers, of course, can do on the farm. I think what was uh, really great to hear, as Hannah talked about at the beginning of today's webinar, was about sustainability and how it's, you know, has the, its three lenses around it. It's not just about the environment, it's about social issues, of course, environment and economics. And it was great to hear you, Vivian, discuss about being more economically sustainable in your farm operation as well. Um, as we go to maybe some questions, if anyone does have any that they want to put in the q and I would like to ask, when you were discussing about the performance of Young Stock Project that you did uh, with Rodrigo, Vivian, why did you decide to raise six or seven uh, heifers a month instead of the five that Rodrigo from Lactinet had suggested? Um, I'll be answering for Vivian because she's less at ease with English, but actually the math was good and we had let some error margins in it. So that was not the problem. The problem was going from 12 to 5. They thought it was a lot in just one shot. So they wanted to, to go step by step and start with six or seven. So it was really just because they were insecure with going from 12 to 5. But also because uh, these calculations need to be updated on a regular basis because their objectives change. So we need to make sure that the replacement heifers follow with these objectives. So it was just because we also over the, the long period of time um, did the calculations again to make sure that everything was good. But at, at the beginning, it was just because they thought it was a big step to take in just one shot. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Josiane, for answering on behalf of Vivian. And I appreciate, Vivian, uh, all the time and energy that you clearly give to this conversation because you can tell you're uh, doing an incredible job with business from a sustainability lens. So thank you very much for joining us uh, today. I'm going to kick it back over to you, uh, Hannah, to uh, share some more information as we begin to wrap up here, our webinar by 3 o'clock on sustainable practices. So over to you. So with this table, we're summarizing how the main best managed practices associated with the two themes of the webinar, which are feed and enteric methane and herd management, will be able to potentially improve milk productivity as well as reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see in the last two columns here, the level of return on investment and the estimated reduction in the milk carbon footprint. Certain practices contribute to carbon sequestration. Well, here we're just focusing on presenting you with practices that actively contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions as well as improving production efficiency. For these three best managed practices, the potential on the farm's greenhouse gas balance can be greater than 15%. This is an order of magnitude, of course, and it remains a potential because there is always greater variability in practice from one herd to another. And next, we'll show you a case study as an example. Agriclimate is an ongoing pilot project in Quebec, where more than 30 commercial farms so far have been assessed for their greenhouse gas balance and the calculation of the carbon footprint of milk. They're then advised and then assessed again for the greenhouse gases. Here's an example of one of them. So in this case, the replacement rate was particularly high compared to the average number of cows. And the isolated effect of keeping cows in production longer and therefore reducing the replacement rate could be quantified. Replacement heifers has now been reduced down to 55 from 88 and the associated greenhouse gases uh, went down accordingly. So in the end, the carbon footprint of this farm's milk was reduced by 6% while maintaining milk productivity and income. This decision made it possible to reduce expenses or to allocate the money saved for other activities or investments. This is a great win-win example for both the environment and the economy. 
To conclude, we must keep in mind that it is by multiplying several actions on several significant greenhouse gas sources on the farm that's going to benefit and add up to achieve substantial greenhouse gas reductions. Great, thank you so much, Hannah. I feel like there was a lot of information uh, processed today, taking in a lot of new terms and definitions. And of course, for our farmers and our industry professionals, thinking about how we apply this back on farm. Uh, there are a number of great resources to continue to learn from uh, to keep this conversation and dialogue going. So of course, we provided the URLs there. The easiest way is to most likely grab your smartphone if you have one and scan the QR code that is on the screen in front of you. And that link will take you directly to Lactinate, Lactinet's website that has all of those resources available, um, where you will find a further information, um, you know, guides and uh, reading that is good to do, uh, as well as Lactinet uh, products and services. And this same QR, uh, QR code, if you scan it as well, takes you to the same link. And it will discuss some of the programs and incentives that, of course, av are available as part of this uh, whole conversation about sustainability um, in our agri-food sector and, of course, dairy specifically. As we begin to wrap up today, I know we do want to keep, um, uh, actually, I do, sorry, I do see that there is a question here uh, before we maybe do wrap up, because we do have four minutes. Um, I see there was a question here um, from Stefan asking, and so if we can have maybe Vivian, Josiane uh, rejoin us, I do want to ask this question. Um, what growth rates are you achieving in your efforts, or what are your goals? So if we have time to answer that, uh, I'm sure there's some people on the webinar who would love to hear that question if we're able to have them join us again. So uh, Josiane, if you don't mind, of course, we know there's uh, we're doing some translation um, to Vivian. So what growth rates are is Vivian achieving in her heifers and what are her goals with her growth rates in her heifers? Um, we were just taking the reports out from the project Rodrigo did. Um, actually, we're around between one and one point four, I think, uh, in the daily uh, uh, gain, but uh, the objective is that they uh, obtain 55% of their mature body weight at what the uh, the the uh, say yeah, where this is. Three hundred and seventy days. Three hundred and seventy days. No, but the the how many days? Three hundred and seventy days. At three hundred and seventy-five days. So. That's really like the objective that that we have, so uh, so they can be inseminated at that time. Yeah. That's great, thank you. And hopefully, Stefan, that answered your question. I I was gonna say if when I was watching the video, I was watching the calves jumping around. I'd say your the health of your calves is, is a great sign when they're that happy in the pen behind you as you're doing an interview and coming up and licking you. So uh, good job. <laughs> So again, I uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time. We appreciate that everyone was able to stay with us this long and, of course, wrap up before our three o'clock deadline. Of course, none of this could be possible without our webinar today funded by Dairy Farmers of Canada. So thank you so much for Dairy Farmers of Canada for funding this. And of course, thank you to Lactinet for helping to put this on for our dairy farmers and our industry professionals and dairy community as part of the DFC Nas National Dairy Knowledge Transfer Project. Um, we really appreciate everyone joining us today. As we mentioned, this is the first webinar of three, so there will be two more after this. Our next webinar is coming up on Thursday, March 21st at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, same time slot as this one. And of course, we'll be talking about genetics and manure management. So we really hope you're able to join us and continue on in this conversation about sustainability in the Canadian dairy industry. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again soon, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you.